Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. On Parliament Hill today, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland is joined by Ministers Anita Anward, National Defense, Sean Fraser, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship, to provide an updated uh, on, updated comments on Canada's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The federal government is revoking the most favored nation trade status for Russia and uh, Belarus, subjecting them to a 35 cent tariff on exports to, to Canada. For the Ukrainians fleeing the war, the government is opening a new Immigration steam for those coming to Canada temporarily and another for those staying on a permanent basis. Canada is providing Ukraine with an additional supply of lethal aid consisting of rocket launchers, hand grenades, and $1 million to fund purchases of modern high-resolution satellite imagery. So let's listen to the next segment from Christia Friedland and the ministers joining her. Most favored nation status as a trading partner under Canadian law. We are working closely with our partners and allies to encourage them to take the same step. Simply put, this means that Russia and Belarus will no longer receive the benefits, particularly low tariffs, that Canada offers to other countries that are fellow members of the WTO. Instead, Russia and Belarus will be subject to a tariff of 35% on their exports to Canada. The only other country that does not enjoy MFN status with Canada is North Korea. Last night, we also announced that Canada will sanction 10 executives from Rosnia, Russia's leading oil company, and from Gazprom, a major Russian state-owned energy company. This will bring the total number of people and entities sanctioned, or in the process of being sanctioned, by Canada since Russia's illegal occupation of Crimea in 2014 to more than 1,000. Comme nous le disons depuis le début de l'invasion barbare de l'Ukraine par la Russie, nous ferons tout ce qui est en notre pouvoir pour que le président Poutine, ses complices, ceux qui lui permettent d'agir, ainsi et l'économie russe paie le prix de cette grave erreur historique. Nous ne pouvons pas lui permettre de réussir, et nous ne le ferons pas. Le président Poutine a choisi d'envahir une démocratie souveraine et s'en prendre à grands coups de masse à l'ordre international fondé sur des règles. Ce même ordre qui nous a permis de connaître une période de prospérité économique sans précédent. Les membres de l'élite financière russe peuvent croire que leur lien étroit avec les conseils d'administration et les yacht clubs d'Occident les protégeront. Mais ils ont tort. Nous ne laisserons pas les Russes et les institutions russes, qui sont centraux dans la kleptocratie déchue du président Poutine, 
jouir de cette prospérité, dont les fondements même sont menacés par eux. The G7 has already imposed the strongest sanctions ever inflicted on a major economy on Russia, and more will follow in the days to come. The ruble has been down by as much as 30 percent this week. On Monday, Russia's central bank raised its benchmark interest rate to 20 percent. The Russian stock market is closed today for the fourth consecutive day. Moody's and Fitch have now downgraded Russian government debt to junk status. The economic costs of the Kremlin's barbaric war are already high, and they will continue to rise. Le Canada et ses alliés sont unis pour condamner le président Putin et sa guerre d'agression. Et nous sommes unis dans notre soutien au remarquable peuple ukrainien qui résiste si courageusement à son insulte. Pour plus de détails sur le soutien que nous apportons au peuple ukrainien, je cède la parole maintenant à mon collègue, le ministre des Migrations, des Réfugiés et de la Citoyenneté, Sean Fraser. Slava Ukraini. And Sean, now over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon uh, or good morning, uh, bon matin. Uh, Canada is ready to welcome Ukrainians fleeing Vladimir Putin's war, and there is no limit to the number of applications that we are going to be willing to accept. Le Canada accueillera les Ukrainiens qui cherchent à fuir la guerre de Vladimir Poutine. The reason for our commitment goes beyond the historic ties between Canada and Ukraine. It goes beyond the cultural connections between our people. I can't help but think that centuries from now, historians will be writing of the courage on display in Ukraine today, from the fearless leadership of President Zelensky to the young fathers with tears in their eyes delivering their children to safety before they return to the front lines to fight in a war that they never wanted but know that they have to win, to the unarmed grandmothers confronting Russian soldiers, telling them that they ought to place seeds in their pockets so that sunflowers may grow while their bodies rest on Ukrainian soil. These are the stories of courage and the stories of heroes that are going to be told for generations to come. Ce qui justifie notre engagement à offrir une refuge aux Ukrainiens qui le cherchent, c'est qu'en s'opposant à la tyrannie et à l'oppression de Poutine, ils font progresser en Ukraine les valeurs démocratiques qui nous dé définissent en tant que Canadiens. We believe in the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity of nations. We believe in the right of peoples to self-determination. These are the values that underpin the founding documents of the United Nations and form the basis of the international rules-based legal order that has helped deliver peace and prosperity to Canadians for the better part of a century. But if we fail to breathe life into these important texts by choosing not to defend the principles behind the documents when they are under attack, then they are worth no more than the paper on which they are written. That's why we're launching two new special programs for Ukrainians who want to come to Canada temporarily and for those who wish to stay. For those who need a safe haven while the war ravages their homeland, we are creating the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. Pour ceux qui souhaitent venir au Canada pendant que la guerre ravage le pays, nous avons créé l'autorisation de voyage d'urgence Canada-Ukraine. There will be no limit on the number of applications accepted under this stream. The primary motivation for this new program is that it provides the fastest way for us to start welcoming as many Ukrainians as possible and will allow them to stay for a period of up to two years. We're waiving most of the requirements that exist under a traditional visa. In order to qualify, individuals will need to complete a simple application form and provide biometrics for security and background screening. To help ensure this process can be executed in a timely way, we started moving biometric kits and other materials to the region in mid-January. This means that we have both the equipment and personnel in place to take biometrics in Warsaw, Vienna, and Bucharest, in addition to 30 other location, locations throughout Europe. We're ready to extend hours of operation and add more staff as needed, where needed. Everyone who arrives under this new stream will also be eligible for an open work permit or study permit that will allow them to take a job with any Canadian employer or enroll in an education program. 
Et comme annoncé précédemment, IFCC délivrera également des permis de travail ouverts aux visiteurs, travailleurs et étudiants ukrainiens qui se trouvent actuellement au Canada et ne peuvent rentrer chez eux. We'll also be waiving application fees to remove the additional financial burden for families. Any Canadian employer willing to hire Ukrainians may do so, and I encourage the Canadian business community to step up and do their part to help support those coming into Canada in their time of need, and I want to say thank you to the employers who've already reached out, saying that you want to do your part. I've heard from the Ukrainian Canadian community that many fleeing the violence will want to return to their homeland and to their families when the war comes to an end. I've heard that others, particularly those with family in Canada, may wish to stay. That is why we are also introducing an expedited path to permanent residency for Ukrainians seeking to reunite with family members who are already in Canada through a new family sponsorship program. C'est pourquoi nous introduisons également une voie accélérée vers les résidences permanentes pour les Ukrainiens qui cherchent à réunir les membres de leur famille qui se trouvent déjà au Canada. This program will allow a wider circle of family members to be resettled in Canada compared to traditional family reunification streams. We're going to be working closely with members of the Ukrainian Canadian community and the Ukrainian Canadian Congress in particular to finalize the details of this new program in the coming weeks. More than a month ago, we also moved to implement priority processing for Ukrainians who wish to reunite with family, study, work, or start a new life here in Canada. Et depuis janvier, IRCC, plus de 6 000 Ukrainiens sont arrivés au Canada dans le cadre de divers programmes. Nous avons également lancé une ligne téléphonique dédiée à l'immigration et un formulaire de demande en ligne dédié à l'Ukraine, disponible au Canada à l'étranger pour répondre aux demandes d'immigration, afin que les demandeurs puissent obtenir de l'aide plus rapidement. Aux Ukrainiens qui sont prêts à donner leur vie pour défendre les valeurs auxquelles nous tenons, nous sommes à vos côtés non seulement dans nos paroles, mais aussi dans nos actes. We are unwavering in our commitment to do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, to help you succeed in your efforts to win this war. We will provide equipment to help defend your homeland. We will provide financial support to help stabilize your economy. We will impose economic sanctions on your oppressor. And today, we will offer safe haven to your families while you fight on the front lines of a war to defend your freedom from tyranny to the benefit of the entire world. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. Slava Ukraini. And I think it's over to the Minister of Defence, Anita Nand, now. Merci beaucoup, Christia and Sean. Good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. It has been just over one week since Russia further invaded and brutally attacked Ukraine. One week of witnessing the horrific consequences of Putin's unprovoked war on innocent people and one week of unshakable courage for um, our Ukrainian friends. While Putin's attacks have steadily intensified, so has our military support for Ukraine in coordination with our allies. We will leave no stone unturned when it comes to supporting our friends in Ukraine as they fight for their lives and their right to exist. To this end, I am announcing today, in addition to the various tranches of military equipment that we have pledged to in the last 30 days, two new significant contributions. First, we intend to supply additional lethal aid to Ukraine, which includes up to 4,500 M72 rocket launchers and up to 7,500 hand grenades. These weapons will be drawn from the Canadian Armed Forces' existing stockpiles and will be transported to the region as quickly and safely as possible. Given the nature of the conflict, we are not providing details relating to transit. Second, we will be providing Ukraine with $1 million towards the purchase of high-resolution, modern satellite imagery. This capability will provide Ukraine's military with a strengthened ability to monitor the movement of Russian forces in and around their territory.
Nous n'allons rien négliger pour soutenir nos amis ukrainiens qui se battent pour leur vie et leur droit d'exister. À cette fin, j'annonce qu'en plus des diverses tranches d'équipements militaires que nous nous sommes engagés à fournir à l'Ukraine au cours des 30 derniers jours, que nous nous remettons en marche avec deux nouvelles contributions importantes. Premièrement, nous avons l'intention de fournir une aide létale supplémentaire à l'Ukraine, notamment jusqu'à 4 500 lances roquettes et jusqu'à 7 500 grenades à main. Ces armes seront tirées des stocks existants des forces armées canadiennes et seront transportées dans la région aussi rapidement et sûrement que possible. Deuxièmement, nous allons fournir également à l'Ukraine un million de dollars pour l'achat d'imagerie satellite moderne à haute résolution. Cette capacité permettra aux militaires ukrainiens de mieux surveiller les mouvements des forces russes à l'intérieur et autour de leur territoire. Our choices in the measures we take are informed by constant conversations with our allies and with Ukraine. I am in daily contact also with Minister Resnikov, and yesterday I spoke with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and the Defence Ministers of Denmark, Norway and Sweden. As we see the horrific impacts of Putin's aggression, we must continue to remember that our allies and partners are united and that we are going to keep adding to the measures to support Ukraine's sovereignty, security and territorial integrity. La brutalité des impacts que nous voyons sur nos écrans met tout le monde en colère. Un conflit plus intense et plus violent n'est pas ce dont nos amis ukrainiens, le monde et certainement les Canadiens ont besoin ou veulent. Une Ukraine indépendante, la paix dans la région et la restauration de l'ordre mondial, voilà notre objectif et celui de nos partenaires et alliés. Only Putin knows what Putin will do. And it is our job to do everything we can to protect as many lives as possible together with our NATO allies. As the Minister of National Defence, my commitment, our government's commitment, is to continue to do exactly that in the hours, days and weeks to come. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Miigwech. Okay, we're going to get started with questions in the room. One question, one follow. Rachel. Hi, ministers. Rachel Haynes from CTV National News. Um, my question is for Minister Freeland um, about the sanctions. You, you talked about how the G7 has already issued some of the strongest sanctions and that there are more to come. However, other G7 allies have come under fire for not doing enough to sanction individuals like Boris Johnson in the UK. Um, are you noticing any type of impact that these sanctions are actually having on Vladimir Putin's behavior? As we're seeing, there has been a bombardment of all these cities, hospitals, an increased shelling in Kyiv. Are these sanctions actually having an impact? Uh, the sanctions are absolutely having an impact. Uh, and that's why I outlined in my remarks the very significant impact our measures are having directly on the Russian economy. So, you know, ruble down 30 percent, interest rates up to 20 percent, Fitch and Moody's downgrading Russian debt to junk. The stock exchange closed for the fourth day in a row. This is a significant and direct impact, which is already being felt by every single person in Russia. And that's a really big deal, because let's remember the toughest measures only came into force on Monday morning. When it comes to the individuals, the oligarchs and the people in Putin's inner circle who are being sanctioned, this is 
definitely having an impact as well. These are people who have tried to have it both ways for a long time. They're people who have been hangers on of Vladimir Putin, his sycophants, his enablers, as he has become more and more of a threat to the world. But at the same time, they have enjoyed a pretty fabulous lifestyle in the West with yachts and mansions and having their kids at the fanciest universities and private schools. And what we've done with these measures much more forcefully than the Russian elite anticipated is we have said, you know what? You have to pick sides. And I can tell you it is having an impact. And one concrete way that we are seeing that impact is some of the oligarchs are starting to speak out. That's what they're, if that's what they're saying in public, imagine what conversations are happening within the Kremlin and inside Russia. And that's exactly what needs to happen. And, you know, I do want the Russian leadership to understand, Russian oligarchs to understand, we're going to keep on going. Uh, there is a tremendous willingness among the world's democracies to just continue ratcheting up the pressure. And as I hope the Russian leadership has seen, we are being very creative. We are using tools which no one would even have imagined deploying just a week ago, and there's more to come. What kind of conversations have you been having with your allies, or I'm sure you don't probably won't go into specifics in public. Probably you not. You normally tell us you don't like to uh, tell us your negotiations in public, but um, in terms of the UK specifically, where there have been calls for them to do more, um, have you had any direct conversations with your counterparts in the UK about doing more? 100%, yeah. I am in close touch with Chancellor Rishi Sunak. Uh, I spoke to him over the weekend. He and I text each other several times a day. And, of course, he and I were both at the uh, G7 finance ministers meeting early on Tuesday morning, and we had a quick follow-up phone call, the two of us, afterwards to talk about follow-on actions. Um, I really uh, believe, and I think we see this in the actions, that all of our G7 partners are extremely resolute and determined to continue ratcheting up the pressure. There is a real unity of will, unity of commitment. And that's a good thing. That's, it's necessary. Bonjour, Raymond Fillion de TVA. Madame Freeland, lorsqu'on parle de tarifs qui vont atteindre 35 sur les importations de Russie, est-ce que ça risque d'avoir un impact sur les prix que paient les Canadiens pour certains biens? Donc, de pénaliser les Canadiens. Um, pour dire la vérité, L'impact aux Canadiens euh, et au Canada sera très, très, très minimal. Euh, le Canada a fait une chose que je crois euh, était intelligente après l'invasion de la Crimée. Euh, on a commencé après l'invasion de la Crimée euh, en imposant les sanctions graves contre la Russie, et en même temps, la politique de notre gouvernement, la politique quand j'étais la ministre euh, du commerce international, était de ne pas encourager euh, les compagnies canadiennes euh, d'être actives en Russie. Euh, et c'était une politique intentionnelle parce que j'ai pensé, notre gouvernement a pensé, que on verra du plus du président Poutine et que ce sera un risque économique pour le Canada et pour les compagnies canadiennes d'avoir des liens plus proches avec la Russie. Alors, euh, entre les pays de G7, je pense que le Canada à des liens économiques euh, les moins sérieux 
avec la Russie, de tous les pays du G7, on est bien positionné euh, en matière, euh, bien positionné stratégiquement et, et dans notre économie. Et c'était intentionnel. Et je suis, je suis très contente aujourd'hui qu'on peut imposer des sanctions significatives sans vraiment toucher les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Est-ce qu'on peut dire que vous vivez une véritable guerre économique à la Russie en ce moment? Je pense qu'on peut dire qu'on prend des mesures très, très fortes, plus fortes que jamais, et qu'on va continuer. Yasmine Médi, avec Radio-Canada, je fais un peu euh, du pouce sur ce que mon collègue dit. Bon, on vous entend depuis une semaine annoncer des sanctions, dire qu'on veut mettre de la pression sur Vladimir Poutine. Est-ce que l'objectif du Canada aujourd'hui, c'est un changement de régime en Russie? Les affaires internes de la Russie sont une question pour les Russes. Euh, L'objectif du Canada, c'est un changement de la politique étrangère de la Russie. Euh, c'est l'arrêt du guerre barbare et illégal que la Russie fait maintenant contre l'Ukraine. Et c'est très important pour nous de démontrer aux leaders de la Russie à l'élite russe et même au peuple russe, qu'ils ne peuvent pas en même temps faire la guerre contre l'ordre international fondé sur les règles et faire partie de la prospérité qui était créée par cet ordre. C'est ce qu'on est en train de démontrer. Les conséquences sont là et c'est Très important pour la Russie, pour tous les Russes, de comprendre que les conséquences vont euh, continuer de s'élever. Et, et je veux aussi dire une chose, et c'est que euh, il y a des gens dans la Russie qui ont commencé de critiquer cette guerre barbare. Et je pense que c'est important de respecter à euh, la position de ces gens russes. Euh, ils sont vraiment courageux. Ce n'est pas une chose facile euh, quand tu vives dans une dictature de critiquer ce que la dictature fait. Et je veux vraiment, euh, je veux vraiment dire aux ces gens russes courageux, à euh, ces gens russes moraux, que euh, on est connaissant de ce qu'ils font, euh, ce qu'ils font, et c'est très important. Et en suivi sur la question de l'immigration, là, on comprend qu'il y a deux programmes que vous annoncez aujourd'hui, mais on n'annonce pas une levée totale des visas pour les Ukrainiens. Êtes-vous capable de nous dire pourquoi exactement Puis est-ce que c'est parce qu'il y a un risque sécuritaire Je vais dire quelques mots, et après ça, je pense que notre ministre excellente immigration pour continuer. Euh, je veux seulement dire que je sais que les Canadiens et Canadiennes euh, veulent accueillir les Ukrainiens. Et je le sais parce que pour moi, maintenant, c'est impossible de lire mes courriels parce que les gens savent que je suis une ministre, ils savent que je suis Canadienne d'origine ukrainienne. Et je dois vous dire que il me semble que chaque personne que je connais m'a envoyé un courriel en disant « J'ai de l'espace dans ma maison pour 10 Ukrainiennes. J'ai de l'espace pour 20 Ukrainiennes. Ma compagnie veut donner des emplois aux, 100, aux 5 Ukrainiennes. » Des choses comme ça. Il y a vraiment un grand esprit canadien. Et c'est une chose excellente. Je dois dire que nous sommes un pays merveilleux. Euh, et cet esprit euh, m'a encouragé beaucoup. Euh, ce que le ministre de l'Immigration a annoncé aujourd'hui permettra le Canada d'accueillir dans une manière efficace et vite beaucoup d'Ukrainiens. 
C'est ce que les Canadiens veulent faire et c'est ce que notre gouvernement va les aider en faisant. Uh, mais maintenant, je passe la parole au ministre de l'Immigration. Sean, do you want to say a few more things? Uh, merci pour la question. Uh, oh, oui, oui. Uh, nous avons mis en place un processus simplifié, uh, simplifié qui nous uh, permet d'accueillir des Ukrainiens qui fuient uh, la guerre de, le, le plus rapidement qu'ils pensent et en toute sécurité. Uh, just um, uh, in, in English, um, look, let me first build upon the, the comments um, uh, that Minister Freeland just shared. Uh, the first reaction was uh, when my phone was blown up. I saw a text from my mom. Uh, mom said she'd take six. Um, there are thousands of communities filled with moms like that, filled with businesses, filled with organizations that want to help. My primary uh, motivation uh, was speed. Uh, my first reaction when I saw that there was a potential influx of Ukrainians who would be seeking safe haven was to figure out uh, what can Canada do? Can we offer a refugee resettlement process? When I dig it, dug in on that, I very quickly realized that it would take potentially years to settle people uh, as refugees. And I was hearing from the Ukrainian community that people wanted to come potentially temporarily, not as refugees. Um, My second reaction was to look at a visa waiver. Uh, when I actually examined the mechanics that would be required to implement it, I discovered very quickly it was going to require particular regulatory changes and certain renovations to our IT system, both internal to our department and with airlines to actually recognize through the electronic travel authorization program we have for other countries that have visa-free travel. And it was going to take 12 to 14 weeks. We don't have 12 to 14 weeks. We're going to be able to stand up the new program I've announced today much quicker than that and start welcoming people uh, in a more expeditious way. I should point out as well that we do want to make sure that Canadians have faith we can manage this in a professional way that protects our security, as you've, you've suggested. Uh, when we made the decision to welcome an unlimited number of applications, We also have to recognize that Canadians want to know that we're doing it in a responsible way. Uh, so those are the reasons, uh, primarily speed, but also making sure Canadians have faith we're doing this in the safest possible way. I got to go to the Zoom line. I'm sorry, because we're if we can keep the answers tight, then we can maybe come back to the room. But I got to go to the Zoom. So uh, first up is Stephen Chase, Globe and Mail. Hi, Steve Chase here, Globe and Mail. I just want to follow up on my uh, colleague's question. Um, why didn't you, the visa, the, the main feature of a visa application that I'm interested in is that it requires a security check. Um, and, and I'm assuming that's part of the reason why you kept the visa requirement in place, even though there's 60 other countries and jurisdictions that get visa free access to this country. Uh, who are you worried about um, getting to this country uh, if there was no security check that is are you worried about um certain uh you know people who may be misrepresenting themselves and using visa free access to get to canada if you were to drop that visa requirement uh look uh, th thanks very much for the question and i, I think uh j just to uh, reiterate Uh, when you do have uh, a complete visa waiver, uh, that means that uh, everyone can come uh, who, who is a Ukrainian national. Um, it also opens the door for others who might slip through the cracks. Uh, we've heard concerns uh, about certain individuals, such as those who've supported and fought against the Ukrainian army in Putin's war for the past eight years in the Donbass, as well as those who are currently working against Ukraine and assisting Russian troops. By having the biometric analysis, we're going to be able to screen out uh, those, as uh, is the case with all of our Five our Eyes uh, intelligence partners. Uh, but we've been prepared to deal with this, and we started moving additional biometric kits into the region more than a month ago to make sure that we have the capacity to do this. Um, I anticipate that we're going to be able to uh, process people in large numbers in a very expeditious way and still protect against that security risk of the people who've actually been fighting against Ukrainians for the past eight years. And I will, I will just relinquish my follow-up so you can go on. Okay. Uh, next up is Boris Prou, Le Devoir. Uh, bonjour. Ma question s'adresse aussi au ministre Fraser, toujours une relance uh, de mes collègues. Je voulais savoir, uh, pouvez-vous m'expliquer exactement ce qui va changer dans le processus? Je comprends qu'un visa va toujours être nécessaire, mais qu'il y aura peut-être moins de documentation à fournir Pouvez-vous préciser ça? Uh, 
Euh, oui, merci pour la question. Et je pense que vous êtes d'accord si je pose ma réponse en uh, anglais, um, just because I want to get the uh, the, the details uh, accurately. Uh, so there's essentially two things in the process that'll be required. Uh, one, uh, a simple application form, and two, uh, biometrics. Um, normally, there would be additional uh, documents that would be required, and we've tried to pull a program off the shelf simpler, similar to our uh, temporary visa program and erode as many of the administrative barriers as possible so we can make it easier to get into the program and make it quicker to process. In addition, people will be eligible for an open work permit when they arrive. There will be no requirement for a labor market impact assessment. There will be no consideration of NOP codes. Uh, there will be no consideration of uh, language requirements. You'll be able to work and study as part of this program after you arrive too. Um, so we've essentially tried to look at our programs that allow people to travel to Canada and allow them to work and paired off as many administrative barriers as possible. So you just need to submit the application form and then submit your biometrics, and then we can deal with uh, other elements after you're in Canada to the extent it may be necessary. Merci. En suivi, est-ce que des demandes sous cette forme accélérée seront acceptées à partir d'aujourd'hui? Et combien le ministère euh, prévoit que de, de, quel nombre d'Ukrainiens euh, devrait euh, participer à ça ou faire des demandes selon le ministère. Uh, I'll answer your your questions in reverse order. Uh, so first, there is no limit to the number of applications that we are willing to accept. The reason that we chose this particular pathway is it's the same system that we currently use to process uh, in excess of 2 million applications for temporary visas a year. It's the area where we have the greatest horsepower and the fewest administrative requirements that's going to allow us to process whatever demand we see. The application process is probably going to open in about uh, 14 days, but I should reiterate that the existing temporary residence visa application form is open, and when we see any applications from a Ukrainian national, we have been pulling them out and processing them first since January 19th. Since January, as of yesterday, there were 6,131 Ukrainians that had already arrived in Canada. We have been working very hard to make it as quick as possible. And if there is an application, not just for permanent residency or temporary residency, but for proof of citizenship, for study permits, for work permits, any application in IRC system, IRCC system that is attached to a Ukrainian national has been prioritized on a priority basis uh, since January 19th. And we're going to continue to do that up until the moment that the new application application system goes live. Okay. Uh, next on the Zoom line, we're going to go with David Aiken from Global News. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question uh, for, uh, for Minister Freeland. Um, Minister, lots of uh, members of the gallery, most members of the press outside our country, have been writing about your unique, I don't know, like I call like uh, heritage. Uh, attributes in helping to mobilize sort of the international alliance against this. I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that, your ability to speak. Uh, you're probably the only G20, I assume, foreign minister that speaks Ukrainian, that has that background in Russia. Could you reflect a little bit about that, that bit of you in dealing with this particular crisis? I don't really want to, David, because I think our focus should be on the really, really brave people of Ukraine. And I think they are the ones who have turned this around. Um, you know, I think that when it turned out that Western deterrence efforts hadn't worked, and when Putin launched his barbaric attack on Ukraine a week ago, just over a week ago, the sort of mainstream expert prediction was that Ukraine would fall and it would fall very quickly. And the Ukrainians proved everybody to be wrong, uh, starting with President Zelensky. And his, I think it's going to go down in his, his historic line, I need ammo, not a ride. And what we are seeing across Ukraine is a very, very determined people uh, who have decided they're willing to fight and die for democracy and for freedom. 
And I think that that incredibly brave, incredibly spirited resistance has inspired the West. I think the Ukrainians are the leaders now. And, you know, I think you could say maybe the West, Western democracies, maybe we were kind of losing our mojo. You know, we were getting a little bit cynical about whether democracy really works. We were getting a little bit cynical about whether regular people really care about democracy and freedom. I think maybe we were getting a little bit cynical about the ability of democracies to act together quickly and in a united way. And I think Putin was counting on that. I think Putin and Russian disinformation actually for years now has been trying to make us in the West cynical about democracy. And I think he thought his campaign had been working. And I think maybe some of us thought that too. And I think, and I speak for myself, but I've heard this from many leaders of other Western countries and non-Western countries too. You know, the Kenyan uh, UN ambassador made a remarkable, remarkable statement. And I've heard it from lots of Canadians. I think seeing the Ukrainians stand up and say, we may be smaller than you, you may have a fierce army that is bigger than ours, but we will not submit. I think that that is what has been transformative. And I'm very proud of them. I'm very inspired by the people of Ukraine. And I think the whole world is. Uh, thanks for that. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.